will be presenting for about 20 uh, minutes each. And after that, we'll have some Q&A. And there will be a follow-up um, survey for feedback, and we greatly appreciate hearing from, from everyone. So uh, I was going to make some introductions and I'll continue even though we're hopefully going to be seeing some more people. So it's uh, it's really my pleasure to introduce some of the people at the Kidney Foundation before the presentation begins um, and wanted to let you know, as I've referred to for, with Dr. Joanne Capella's joining us and Dr. Leanne Stalker. So thank you both for taking the time to uh, be with us today. Dr. Norm Muirhead, as most of you know, is the president of of the Ontario branch for Kidney Foundation. Anthony Troni is the executive director of our uh, the Ontario branch. And Daniela Petrowski is a director of philanthropy and community development at Ontario branch. Also joining us are a number of the Kidney Foundation lead staff representing over um, our 16 chapters across Ontario. So these individuals are key to our regions and are available for support. So I will ask Dr. Muirhead if you'd like to say a few words. Thanks very much, Andrea. Just like on behalf of the Ontario branch of the Kidney Foundation to thank everyone for agreeing to attend today and in particular, uh, for our donors, I want to thank you for your past generosity. Uh, tonight's event is an opportunity for you to see what happens to those donor dollars and uh, in particular how they fund research, as Andrea has already alluded to, uh, in our constant search to uh, find an answer uh, for uh, patients who are living with kidney disease in Canada, the one in 10 Canadians living with chronic kidney disease. So this is an opportunity to find out a little bit more about what the Kidney Foundation funds in terms of research, how that research can make a difference, and to have any questions that you might have about how we set about that uh, enterprise uh, answered. So thanks once again for taking the time uh, to uh, attend this evening, and hopefully you'll find this both informative and productive. Thanks again. Thanks, Dr. Mirahead. Uh, so uh, let's get started with the formal part. Uh, it's my pleasure now to introduce Dr. Joanne Capel. Dr. Capel is a clinical professor of medicine in the Division of Nephrology at the University of Saskatchewan. She's currently the physician lead for kidney health and the medical lead for the Chronic Kidney Disease Clinic and the Community Kidney Health Program in Saskatoon, Sask Saskatchewan's Health Authority. She's a medical advisor for the Saskatchewan branch of the Kidney Foundation as well. Recently, Dr. Capel was awarded with the 2023 Lifetime Achievement Award as a key volunteer with the Kidney Foundation for over 30 years. Some of her most impactful work has come through direct work with patients, family members, and other kidney professionals. Thanks for being with us, Dr. Capel. Thank you, Andrea. So Natalie, are you going to turn on my slides? I'm muted, but yes, here we are. Um, can everyone see that OK? Mm -hmm. Awesome. OK, perfect. No, I can't see them. OK, so there is. Hold on just a second. I can try the, the other way as well. Perfect. Perfect. I can see it now, Natalie. Oh, OK, good, good. I just wanted to make sure. OK, perfect. perfect. So uh, thank you, uh, everyone, for attending tonight. Uh, it is around supper hour. I guess we're in Ontario, uh, not quite supper hour here in Saskatchewan. And I hope the weather there is as beautiful as it is here. I'm uh, no snow on the ground yet, so that's always a plus. <laughs> So tonight I'm going to talk about the burden of kidney disease and and Leanne is going to then follow up with uh, what research ha ha does uh, to help uh, uh, all the patients who have kidney disease in Canada and indeed the world. Um, so f for some of the things, uh, I think we need to have a bit of a background, then we'll go into some of the burden and then there'll be lots of time for questions at the end. Uh, next slide, Natalie. So chronic kidney disease is the gradual loss of kidney function. The kidneys are really responsible for a number of things in the body to remove waste from the blood, to keep important minerals like sodium, potassium, calcium uh, well balanced. 
uh, to regulate the amount of water that you have in the body and to produce hormones that really have an impact on your blood pressure and uh, whether or not uh, you have enough red blood cells uh, in, in your body. When, so when the kidneys are not able to perform these functions, there are multiple changes in one's physical health. But declining kidney function and eventual kidney failure affects one's entire life, your physical life, your mental, emotional, and spiritual life. So the impact of chronic kidney disease is not only felt by the person uh, with CKD, uh, but also their family, their community, and certainly the health system. Next slide, Natalie. About 10% of the world's population is presently living with chronic kidney disease. The incidence and prevalence of CKD differs significantly across the world. Every age and race are affected by CKD, uh, but people from disadvantaged populations are at higher risk of CKD and its associated morbidity and mortality. This is really due to the socio to socioeconomic factors and limited access to care. Unfortunately, these circumstances, low socioeconomic status and limited access to care exist in this country, which is considered by the WHO as a high, in, high income country. So we are not immune to uh, all the problems that are associated uh, with uh, a chronic kidney disease. Next slide, Natalie. So you already know that one in 10 Canadians have kidney disease. If we extrapolate that to the number of people, that's about four to four and a half million people in Canada. Perhaps what is not so well known, however, is that one in three Indigenous people has chronic kidney disease. And the lifetime risk of developing diabetes, which is the uh, leading cause of chronic kidney disease in the Indigenous population, is eight of 10 First Nations people will develop uh, diabetes in their uh, lifetime compared to the general population. And over half of First Nations people with diabetes will develop chronic kidney disease. And of those uh, uh, people that uh, develop chronic kidney disease, uh, First Nations people have a higher risk of uh, progressing to end-stage kidney disease. So for instance, in Saskatchewan, which uh, has the second highest uh, a population of First Nations people uh, after Manitoba, 55% of the people that we have on dialysis are Indigenous. Next slide, Natalie. So one of the things uh, that people need to know is that uh, studies have shown that although more women than men have chronic kidney disease, men are more likely than women to progress to kidney failure and they progress to kidney failure sooner than women. And so male is really a risk factor uh, to predict a faster decline in kidney function. And why this is has been postulated as uh, men don't take care of themselves uh, like women do, that may or may not be true. Uh, and it's also some uh, has been linked to testosterone levels. However, having said that, uh, the real reason why men progress faster to end stage kidney disease uh, than women is really not known. Next slide, Natalie. The two most common causes of chronic kidney disease are diabetes and high blood pressure. And these two conditions account for two thirds of all people with CKD and end stage kidney disease. And, but the important thing to remember here is that both diabetes and high blood pressure are potentially preventable diseases. So potentially we could prevent two thirds of people who have chronic kidney disease. Next slide, uh, Natalie. Data from the chronic, uh, from the Canadian Organ Replacement Register reveals that the number of Canadians living with end-stage kidney disease or kidney failure has increased uh, by 31% since 2011. And as of 2020, more than 52,000 Canadians, excluding people from Quebec, uh, were being treated for kidney failure with either dialysis or a kidney transplant. 46% of new patients uh, on kidney replacement therapy were under the age of 65. And in 2019, kidney disease uh, in Canada was the 10th leading cause of death. And kidney disease is predicted to be the fifth leading cause of death by 2040. So it's important to remember that there is no cure for kidney disease. There's no cure for end-stage kidney disease and that both dialysis and kidney transplant are treatments and not cures. 
Next slide, Natalie. So with this bit of background, let's talk about the burden of chronic kidney disease. So in this slide, you'll see that uh, chronic kidney disease really affects all organs of the body. And therefore, there are many physical burdens that a person with CKD must deal with. So CKD increases the risk of cardiovascular disease. And in fact, cardiovascular disease is the most common cause of death in people with CKD. The most common cause of uh, most common uh, cardiovascular death is because of a heart attack or heart failure. People with CKD also have higher rates of depression. They have more problems with sleep. They have a lot of problems with their gastrointestinal system. They often present with intractable itch. They have, there are a lot of uh, issues with leg cramps and uh, with bone uh, pain and bone disease. So really every part of the body uh, is affected uh, by chronic kidney disease and these, uh, these issues become even uh, more of a problem as kidney function uh, decreases. Next slide, Natalie. So not only does the person with chronic kidney disease have to deal with these multiple physical problems, but there are a lot of emotional, spiritual and mental changes as well. So just think about if you've been diagnosed with chronic kidney disease, the question is going to come up as why me? Why did I develop chronic kidney disease? And this sometimes that question of why me can be so overwhelming that other aspects of your health are affected. Emotional well-being is more than just being happy or sad. It really affects how well a person can cope with the emotions of being diagnosed with kidney disease. The denial, the anger, the bargaining, the fear of going on dialysis, the fear of dying. All of those are part and parcel of that diagnosis of chronic kidney disease. And everyone knows that difficulties with emotional well-being often have a negative impact on your mental health and then subsequently an impact on your physical health. So without supports from family, friends, healthcare professionals, the life of a person with chronic kidney disease often can be very uh, unbearable. Um, and compound this then having to react with a challenging health system, a health system that's becoming more challenging day by day. And especially if you have to interact with a health system when you don't have the appropriate health literacy uh, or the even the basic uh, understanding of your very complex medical condition. So this all really impacts how you deal with that simple diagnosis of chronic kidney disease, one organ being affected. So that and this is all then assuming you have access to medical care, which as we all know now, access to medical care is not simple and many people do not have uh, access to primary care providers. Next slide, please. So not only is the patient uh, or the person that has chronic kidney disease dealing with their physical and mental health challenges, but they need to deal with significant changes in their financial situation. And data from Ontario in 2016-2017 indicates that 90% of people with uh, chronic kidney disease have an annual income of less than 30,000 Canadian dollars with 45% of those reporting an annual household income of less than 15,000 Canadian dollars. So in a Kidney Foundation, a publication in 2018 called The Burden of Out-of-Pocket Costs for Canadians with Kidney Failure, nearly 50% of respondents reported that they had a decrease in their annual income since starting dialysis with 67% stating their income had decreased by 40% or more. 41% of those surveyed in that, uh, uh, in that publication were below the Canadian low income cutoff. And just as an example, in 2018, the low income cutoff for a two person household in Canada was $31,000. I just told you that most people had an annual income of less than $15,000. And the low, uh, uh, and in uh, 2022, the low income cutoff in Canada for a four person household was $34,000. So any way you cut it, people who have chronic kidney disease and certainly people who are on dialysis are way below uh, the uh, uh, low income cutoff, which used to be called the poverty line. 
So from this uh, uh, KFOC report, the average uh, annual out-of-pocket expenses related to dialysis was between $1,400 and $2,500, depending upon what dialysis modality people are on, whether it was on peritoneal dialysis or hemodialysis. And these out-of-pocket expenses, so that $2,500, could be up to 12.5% of their annual income, so much so that 21% of the people that responded to this report uh, said that they went without food or without other basic necessities in order to pay for those out-of-pocket expenses. And those out-of-pocket expenses could include things like medications, uh, utility costs like uh, electricity and plumbing if you were on home hemodialysis. Although the good news is through the advocacy of the Kidney Foundation of Canada, most provinces now do pay for uh, I, uh, a utility costs for home hemodialysis. They do provide a subsidy. So that's that's the good news. And that's through, uh, uh, through the efforts of the Kidney Foundation. So there's lots of out of, uh, out of hospital costs for multiple appointments and for the transplant workup. In fact, having no money often delays and prolongs the transplant workup and eventual transplantation. So because they have no money, they can't have the transplant workup to get onto the transplant wait list. If they're not on a transplant wait list, they don't get to have a kidney transplant. So they linger on a more expensive therapy and they, they're they lingering on a more expensive therapy while their, their overall health is deteriorating. So because of the burden uh, of treatment for people with end-stage uh, kidney disease, most are unable to work, and then therefore this causes more financial uh, difficulty, more stress and anxiety. So it's, I'm honestly, I like to say it's like the hamster on the, on the wheel or a dog chasing his tail. One of the biggest expenses that uh, people uh, who are on dialysis uh, have is transportation and parking. Uh, particularly if a patient is on facility uh, hemodialysis. So they have to drive to the hemodialysis unit and then they have to park uh, and they have to pay for that. So average costs of uh, $250 per month uh, is has been uh, for transportation and parking, but there's significant variation really depending upon where one lives and where the hemodialysis unit is located. So for instance, uh, in some parts of Ontario and, and definitely in Saskatchewan, uh, some people will have to travel four hours to come to the, uh, the uh, in-center hemodialysis unit, have their hemodialysis and then travel four hours home. So those, and that's three times a week. And so $250 now with the cost of, uh, of uh, fuel, that doesn't cut it. The costs now are probably generally higher. And so this is that uh, out-of-pocket cost for transportation and parking is spe uh, specifically uh, felt uh, for people who live in rural remote uh, areas and, uh, and uh, Indigenous people who have chronic kidney disease. And so there are other issues with transportation besides the cost, and that includes how do you actually even get transportation? Perhaps you don't have a mobility-assisted transport in your community, so how do you get to how do you get to the dialysis unit? And, and sometimes there's no provincial bus company. And so you have to use a, a car or a truck. And what if you don't have a car or a truck? So you have to rely on others in order to transport you uh, to your hemodialysis. And, and if you do have a car, how do you pay for the gas? How do you pay for vehicle maintenance? So there are a lot of issues uh, with regards to out-of-pocket expenses for people who are on uh, dialysis therapies, particularly if you are on hemodialysis. Costs uh, for transportation, of course, would be less if you were on peritoneal dialysis. Uh, next slide, Natalie. So we often concentrate on, you know, the physical, the mental, the emotional, spiritual uh, burden uh, for the person who has chronic kidney disease or the person who is uh, on, on dialysis. But I think that uh, we can't forget about the caregiver um, because uh, I, the caregiver is very important uh, to the person who has uh, chronic kidney disease and that caregiver often bears significant responsibility for care of the person with CKD, for the person who is on dialysis. 
And this is particularly the case when the person with kidney disease is a child or an adolescent or someone who is who is very old. And because of their care responsibilities, that caregiver often loses touch with friends, with their neighbors, with their community, and eff effectively isolating themselves from social support. So then that adds extra burden to that caregiver. And care responsibilities are not compensated. We don't pay the caregiver to take care of the person uh, who's on dialysis. And then this caregiving responsibility and that non-compensation of their caregiving responsibilities occurs at a time when they often have to decrease their work. So then they too suffer more of a financial burden. Um, the caregiver sometimes is sometimes is is the same age as the patient, and this is sort of the old caring for the old. And so the caregiver may have their own physical illnesses. So, so a person who is already has uh, uh, other illnesses is caring for uh, the person who has uh, end stage kidney disease. And so that the caregiver's physical illnesses then are often exacerbated by those caregiver responsibilities. So then you end up with two patients instead of just one. So the caregiver often feels hopeless feels very guilty make, making sure that they're doing the right thing. They have a huge fear of the future um, because even though they may have accepted that their loved one who has chronic kidney disease, who is on dialysis, may have a shorter life expectancy and may die, they have a fear of their own future because they've not been able to work, not been able to contribute to their RSSP, RRSP or their pension plan. So they have a fear of poverty as they get older. And there's always that fear of when you're the caregiver of doing the wrong thing. So I think that uh, as, a, as a patient uh, a foundation that we do need to not only think about the person who has kidney disease, the person who's on dialysis, the person who's had the kidney transplant, but we need to think of the person that's supporting that individual. Next slide, please. So chronic kidney disease affects the individual, affects the caregiver, affects uh, uh, affects uh, uh, affects the health system, and but then uh, the uh, health system and then and society really have a significant impact on the person with uh, chronic kidney disease. So it's it's a very intertwined uh, 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 support system uh, that uh, uh, affects all of us. Uh, so next slide, please. Kidney care in Canada is expensive. The cost of care for adults with the chronic kidney disease who are not on dialysis is about uh, $14,600 for one year of care. And this is more than twice the cost uh, of care for a person in Canada. This was a study done uh, by Dr. Manns in Alberta in 2015. And certainly costs are higher for those who have uh, uh, conditions like diabetes in association uh, with kidney disease, uh, those who have uh, a lower kidney function, and those who have more protein in the urine. Costs for kidney replacement therapy, um, like uh, and this is based on publications from both Manitoba and Alberta, uh, are, are even more. So if you are on hemodialysis in a facility, Cost for uh, for uh, hemodialysis for one year is about sixty four thousand dollars. For uh, peritoneal dialysis is about thirty nine thousand dollars. For home hemodialysis using a conventional dialysis machine is about thirty nine thousand dollars. And the cost for uh, the first year of a kidney transplant is approximately ninety five thousand dollars. But after that, if the transplant is working, uh, costs uh, uh, diminish uh, uh, at year two to about $40,000 uh, uh, to care for a kidney transplant patient. So the cost, the total cost of providing dialysis treatments in Canada in uh, 2014 was $1.8 billion. Next slide, please. The cost to the Canadian pension plan and private disability insurance payments for Canadians with advanced kidney failure 
I that which is defined as having kidney function of 30 percent or less or or who was on dialysis is about 217 million dollars per year. Uh, but that could be as high as 260 million dollars per year. And these estimates really depend on the number of people who are unable to work. And as you just heard, the burden of chronic kidney disease often means that they can't work. So if we could do reduce the number of people who have advanced kidney failure, either by prevention or by delaying progression uh, or increasing the number of kidney transplants, we could reduce uh, Canadian pension plan and private insurance pay payments by $13.8 million within five years. So if we could do something to prevent people from progressing or going on dialysis uh, or increasing the number of kidney transplants, that's how much money we could actually save. The estimated cost uh, of ca caring for Canadians with CKD who are not on dialysis um, per year is about $32 billion. And these costs are attributable uh, to uh, not only their chronic kidney disease, but to their other medical conditions. And the costs for hospital admission, physician visits and medications uh, for low and high risk uh, non-dialysis patients uh, vary anywhere from $27,000 to about $45,000, depending upon if you're low risk or high risk. The bottom line, I think, from both of these slides is that kidney care is costly. Next slide, please. So if we could intervene early and prevent the development of chronic kidney disease or diagnose chronic kidney disease early and then uh, thus ensuring and implementing appropriate treatments to slow progression, uh, we would be ahead of the game. And th that's the goal of most kidney health programs in Canada and the goal of most kidney health programs in the world is really diagnose early uh, uh, so that you can uh, intervene early with appropriate uh, treatments that have been shown to, uh, to slow progression and sometimes even prevent uh, progression of chronic kidney disease. So studies have shown that you need to screen seven people to identify one person with CKD and therefore do something about it. This is definitely cost effective. Um, I, and in fact, there was a modeling study done in Manitoba uh, that was uh, published in 2017 that showed the cost of screening was $589 uh, per person, while the cost of hemodialysis uh, uh, that year was $75,000. So, for that $75,000, you could screen 127 uh, people and you would find 18 people with chronic kidney disease. And then if they were on appropriate therapy uh, for their high blood pressure, uh, using ACE inhibitors, and now using a medication called SGLT2 inhibitor, which has been shown uh, to, uh, uh, to protect the kidney uh, uh, and uh, slow progression, you could then save a lot of money, but but not only that, it's not all a case about money. It's also a case about improving the quality of life of that person that has chronic kidney disease, uh, because that's what it's all about. So I think that that there's definitely uh, a lot of things that uh, that we can do, and all of these things that I've been talking about have come through by way of research. Next slide, please. So in an ideal world, we would identify and treat risk factors for chronic kidney disease before a person developed established CKD. So at, this actually means starting in utero, as it is known that babies who are born with low birth weight or before 37 weeks of gestation are at higher risk of CKD during their lifespan. So we need to start already there. Um, and we know that children uh, need to have their blood pressure done. Children don't often have their blood pressure done, but if you can find a child that has, or if you diagnose a child with high blood pressure and do appropriate treatment, you can prevent the development of chronic kidney disease down the road. Adolescents need to be uh, counseled about the, the kidney risks of smoking, of early pregnancy, and, and the use of other kidney toxins. And certainly adults need to know and uh, know about 
the risk factors for chronic kidney disease and be screened uh, for a chronic kidney disease, particularly if they have diabetes or high blood pressure or if they're significantly uh, uh, overweight or if they use a lot of uh, anti-inflammatory medications. So we all need to know that uh, there's something we can do. But we also also need to know that as we age, our kidney function unfortunately does decrease as we get older uh, by about one to 2% per year after the age of 40. And that's because our kidneys get old just the same as our brain and our heart gets old. Uh, so, you know, there's many health conditions. Uh, I, there's many things that impact uh, kidney function, but there's a lot of things that we can do. And I'm just incredibly, uh, I'm amazed by uh, by the fact that a lot of people don't know about kidney disease. Next slide, please. It's it, it's entirely uh, amazing to me uh, uh, that awareness of kidney disease is really quite low. It's uh, six percent in the general population only knows about uh, kidney disease. And even people who have high risk conditions like people with diabetes and high blood pressure, only 10% of know, them know that diabetes and high blood pressure could lead to kidney disease. So, and if you don't know about chronic kidney disease, you actually have a 1.44 increased odds of developing end stage kidney disease. Because if you don't know, you don't know what to do about it. So because of how chronic kidney disease affects the whole body, there are still lots of opportunities for us to improve the quality of life for people who have uh, CKD. And there's certainly new technologies, uh, new equipment, new medications that are being developed that uh, uh, could improve the health of those who have chronic kidney disease. Next slide, please. And so with that, um, there are going to be there will be ample time for questions after uh, Leanne's presentation. So uh, uh, write them down uh, as you're thinking about them. I'll pass the torch off. <laughs> Dr. Capel, thank, thank you so much uh, for your presentation. Uh, personally speaking, um, I've learned so much. Uh, from you and uh, the 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 costs are staggering um, mm -hmm. for for this disease that that's the takeaway that I got one was the cost and the other was uh, preventative measures that can be taken and uh, as a mom of uh, young adults as well um, I think it's uh, it's really important um obviously you know to uh and and it's something that i didn't think of to be honest with you was um um the youth and even you were talking about um you know starting starting out even with babies etc i thought it was fascinating uh so mm -hmm. thank you so much and you are very passionate um with your presenting as well so we uh we really appreciate it does anyone have any questions right now for dr capel or you can think about it we have uh time at the end no Okay. All right. So Leanne, I will, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce you uh, to, uh, to the guests. So Dr. Leanne Stalker is the National Director of Research of the Kidney Foundation of Canada uh, and a professional research scientist with a varied background in transplant, stem cells, epigenetics, reproductive biotechnologies, and a wide variety of biomedical platforms. Prior to joining the Kidney Foundation of Canada in January 2021, Leanne worked for the Canadian Donation and Transplantation Research Program as a research manager building relationships with the transplant and donation communities. Leanne has a long-standing interest in roles that integrate research science, science clinical development and patient facing programs. In her current role at the Kidney Foundation, she provides support needed to engage, empower and support the kidney research community to fulfill the Kidney Foundation's research strategies and ultimately improve outcomes for people with kidney disease. To that end, Leanne. Hello. Um, so before I get started, one piece of warning, I am currently presenting from a hotel room. 
And 98% of the time, the internet is fine, but there's a small percentage of the time that it becomes not very good. So for some reason I freeze or you can't hear me, please don't hesitate to tell me. Um, that would be great. So thank you very much uh, to Andrea for inviting me to be here tonight. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm currently joining you from Treaty One Territory in Winnipeg, Manitoba. Um, where I am at the Canadian Society for Transplant Meeting, uh, representing the Kidney Foundation of Canada um, here, including doing some presentations and making sure that the organization's um, connections with the transplant and donation communities are maintained. So it's always a really tough act to follow uh, Joanne. Joanne and I have presented it before, and she always gives such a wonderfully passionate presentation um, about all of the burdens that are associated with kidney disease and all of the wellness and overall um, life-changing events that can happen surrounding a diagnosis and a lifetime dealing with chronic illness. So I am going to follow up that presentation by doing um, a brief introduction to the Kidney Foundation of Canada's research program. Um, I don't go into very many research project specifics, but the presentation is aimed to help people understand what our research program does, how we do it, um, and why it's important, and also just give sort of a brief introduction into the world of kidney research. Um, the last slide of my presentation uh, includes some links, and I'll make sure that Andrea shares it with uh, all of you if you want to have any follow-up or you want to take a look at any of the resources that are available. And I'm also always available um, by email if anybody's interested to learn more. So we're going to get started, uh, and that'll be great. Okay, so the Kidney Foundation of Canada's research program. So for those of you in the room, you may or, not, may or may not be familiar with the fact that the Kidney Foundation of Canada is actually the leading Canadian organization with a direct mandate to support kidney-specific research. So after the Canadian Institute for Health Research, our major national health spending uh, funding part, uh, organization, the KFOC program is exceptionally strong at providing support to both our basic, fundamental, clinical, and allied health researchers in the field of kidney science. Our foundation research program has patient priority at the forefront and is always big picture focused on every aspect of kidney disease. We've invested over $135 million since the inception of our program in research with the overall goal to improve the lives of Canadians who are living with kidney disease and their families and caretakers. And I think that's a really important point to bring back up that Joanne had mentioned earlier, that it's not just the individual with kidney disease that's affected, but really the entirety of their sphere. So whether that be their parent, their guardian, their caretaker, their partner, their children, um, their workplace, and the health systems that surround them. Um, it's important to note that research is a key mandate of the Kidney Foundation of Canada and maintains a key priority in our investment strategy. So I wanted to talk today a little bit about how research is different from some of the other things that the Kidney Foundation of Canada does on a day-to-day -day basis. So a lot of people are very familiar with some of our amazing program offerings such as short-term financial assistance, peer support, um, education, and informational resources to our patients um, and their caregivers. But how does research differ from some of those organizational priorities? The biggest, the biggest difference um, between research and all these other areas is that research is one of the only things that actually gives hope to the next generation and hope to those who are dealing with kidney disease. Although immediate assistance is exceptionally pertinent and very, very, very welcomed from those who are going through the burden of kidney disease, we recognize that that assistance will help that individual and their family, but probably won't help the next person down the line. The only way that we can really make a difference for the next generations of those who may or may not have to deal with kidney disease is through our research efforts. So I'd really like everybody to sort of take a moment to take that lens and think, this is an investment that goes beyond just the current time and really does reach into the future. And we can see a big change because of the research that's happened in how kidney disease patients go through their journey today versus how they might have gone through that journey 50 years ago or even 10 years ago. So how do we do this? How is the research program at the Kidney Foundation of Canada structured? And what are some of the things that we do? How does uh, 
how do donations get invested? What is the importance of the different parts of the program? Um, you know, what, what is exactly how does the program work? So the Kinney Foundation Research Program is focused on several key areas. Um, I apologize, I don't have, oh, maybe I do have a pointer. Oh, guys, look at this, this is fancy. Can you see my pointer? Hey, that's exciting. Um, so the Kinney Foundation of Canada does obviously focus a lot of its time and its effort on our internal research grant competition. So I'm gonna go through each of these areas in more detail throughout my presentation. Um, but the first and foremost, and what most people think of, is actually the funding of research grants. But that is far from all that our research program does and accomplishes. We also focus on programs that are specifically aimed at capacity building. So this means making sure that Canadians have access to good health care, to making sure that they have access to researchers who are focused in the kidney space and who are competitive and ready to lead the next generation with kidney patients front of mind. We also spend a lot of effort ensuring that there's lived experience inclusion in our research program. And this might also spread into some of these other areas, such as the development of resources to ensure that researchers and patients are connected, that patient voices and those with lived experience are heard, um, and that they are, are empowered to play a role in the research, in the research journey. We also participate in uh, areas of education and advocacy. So a lot of the things that Joanne mentioned in her presentation, um, things like even transportation systems, changing, changing access to medications, these types of things. In order to advocate for change, it's often very important to have quantitative evidence to back your claim. And the research department really helps with developing projects that surround some of these requirements. So really finding the evidence that we need to make change through advocacy or the evidence that we need to provide appropriate education material. We also invest quite a bit of time and effort into partnerships. And these partnerships could be with other national organizations, such as the Canadian Institute for Health Research, as previously mentioned, or connections with other not-for-profit organizations to ensure that the full spectrum of kidney disease is being represented within our research portfolio. So I'm going to go over each of these areas a little bit and explain some of the things that we do within them. So the first one is obviously research grants. This is the one that everybody thinks of first and foremost. So the foundational research program has supported over 1,600 separate research grants through our three major grant competitions since the inception of our internal program. This means we have supported 1,600 different pieces of high quality science leading towards changes for how kidney patients and their families live every day. Our internal grant competitions support clinical researchers. So these are our doctors, fundamental scientists. These are our PhD scientists, those that don't have an MD that are working in the fundamental pieces of, of how kidneys function, looking at developing new medications, and our allied health researchers. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the term allied health, which is quite a few, um, quite a few of us in the room potentially, our allied health researchers are those who are focused on patient wellness, but are not doctors necessarily. So these are our pharmacists, our physiotherapists, our nurse practitioners, and people that are really involved in the care team, but not necessarily an MD or a PhD. We think that it's very important to ensure that this community also gets support to develop their research efforts as they often tend to be extraordinarily patient facing. As an example of our investment, I'm gonna use statistics from 2022. So in the 2022 year, um, we committed $4.3 million to research grants um, in that year alone. So that means that we funded $4.3 million of research grants through both our partnerships and our internal programs over this year. For our research investments, we invested $4.2 million in 2022 to research. So it's important to note that from that first line, it includes multi-year commitments. So if we fund a grant, it might last anywhere from one to five years. That second line is a demonstration of how many, how much fully appreciated donor support goes out the door in one calendar year to help support all of these initiatives. In 2022, we supported 31 new research grants. So that's 31 new opportunities for new pieces of knowledge and ability to move the needle forward in kidney care. 
We supported nine early career researchers. So these are our researchers who are in the first three to five years of their research experience. Um, sorry, first one to five years of their research experience. And it's extremely important time to provide support for our researchers because this may be where they might struggle and they might decide, mm, I don't really wanna do research anymore because this is really hard. So we wanna make sure that we're supporting them so that they stay in kidney science and that they can um, make change for our community throughout their careers. We also funded one major partnership in 2022. So what do we fund? So Joanne mentioned a lot of things during her presentation that always, I just love it because it connects so well. When we talk about research and we talk about burden, sometimes people really think of research as looking at developing things like new medications, right? That's a pretty easy one. Pharmaceutical industry, we develop new, new treatment options. You know, you give that to patients, that's pretty clear cut research in everybody's mind, but it's really just so much more than that. I like to divide our research program into these very wide five categories that are listed on the side of the slide here in the pink writing. So I divide everything that we fund into education, prevention, treatment, including donation and transplant, because really that is not a cure. It is, as Coet Jan mentioned, like dialysis, it is a treatment. Wellness. So this is our overall wellness for our patients with the knowledge that being alive does not necessarily make you well and that we need to focus on the full patient experience in order to ensure that our kidney patients and community are living their best lives. And then of course, a cure. So the idea that the only goal of research is to find a cure for kidney disease is not actually accurate. Although this is something that we're exceptionally hopeful that we will find, um, it's important to note that there are just so many more areas of focus that are important along that journey as well. So some of the examples of the areas of funding within some of these sections are evidence for advocacy and program change. So this could be things like um, Joanne had mentioned, you know, covering certain financial assistance pieces, maybe evidence that we need transport covered or that we need dietary changes in schools, things like that. Um, an increased understanding of why and how kidney disease develops that can lend well to educational opportunities for our children and our youth and for our overall population and can also feed into preventative strategies. If we understand why things happen, maybe we can stop them from happening. Um, management of risk to reduce or stop the progression of kidney disease. We know that kidney disease is a progressive um, can be a progressive decline in kidney function. If we could stop everybody in phase one, that would be great. It would remove a lot of burden from everybody. So these ideas that we could manage risk once diagnosis has happened. Improved access to treatment. So this is a big one. People who live in large city centers may have very, or, I mean, easy being relative, but easier access to certain treatment modalities, including home dialysis, PD, or even in-center dialysis. They may also have better access to their doctors, their specialists. Um, things like transport aren't as big of a problem. But as Joanne mentioned, a lot of our rural and remote communities don't have this access. So really doing a lot of studies, making sure that when we talk about serving the Canadian kidney population, we're really talking about serving everybody. Of course, um, new therapies and treatments for kidney disease. This is a really exciting time right now for kidney disease. We've had a lot of new medications that have finally gone through clinical trial approval, and we're seeing some real changes in treatment modalities for those who are on their kidney disease journey for the first time in quite a long time. Of course, we're always looking for more. In the transplant and donation um, area, of course, looking for increasing the use of live and deceased donor kidneys, both systemically and scientifically, ways that we can make donation and transplant more effective, that we can push the needle towards transplant actually becoming a cure. And this includes looking at things like long-term wellness of, of the graft and better transplant outcomes. We often in this space get caught up in, in increasing the number of people registering for donation, but it's important to mention that if the organs don't get transplanted or the transplants don't last, that this won't help in the long run. So really that entire continuum, all the way from donation, education, and efficiency, all the way through to long-term outcomes for our transplant patients. Things like improved survival rate, 
quality of life, supporting our allied health communities, and then of course, novel cures. So on this slide, um, I just took the opportunity to list a couple of projects that we're currently funding within our portfolio that really circle back onto this idea of overall wellness. I could definitely put a list of the ones that are looking at new medications or new scientific pathways as well, but I always just think it's a great opportunity to point out some of the things that we study that people might not have thought about. So since it includes things like addressing the mental health needs of parents for pediatric kidney transplant recipients, um, as Joanne also mentioned in her burden talk, sometimes the caregivers are people that aren't getting a lot of attention in terms of ensuring that their overall wellness is also being taken care of. And this is definitely something that we do address in our research portfolio, developing strategies um, to help caregivers with caregiver burnout um, and parental mental health needs. Um, identifying and addressing the educational needs of patients from historically marginalized groups. Um, this is specifically uh, based on less than ideal kidneys for transplants, um, but we do have a subset of projects that are focused on marginalized groups and really looking at what are the requirements for those groups for them to be more informed, uh, more have more access to care, et cetera. Um, this is actually a allied health project. It's a virtual home-based physical prehabilitation project. So this is the same as a lot of people have probably heard of rehabilitation, which is where you get uh, sorted after a medical procedure. But there's also a lot of evidence out there to suggest that the better shape you're in uh, before a transplant, the better that you will do after. So this is actually a physiotherapist running this project, looking at how we can develop strategies to help people be in their best health possible before heading into a transplant. Um, there's a list there. I won't go through all of them today, uh, but I will make sure that you guys get a copy of these slides. And if there's anything here that you're interested in learning more about, or maybe, oh, I never thought about that before, I would be interested in learning more, please don't hesitate to ask. So how do we fund all these projects? What is the process that we go through to do this? And why is that process important? So the Kidney Foundation is nationally valued in the community for our commitment to excellence and our research strategy and mechanisms. I often have partner organizations come to me to ask for advice um, or to ask me to participate in their competitions to ensure that things are held to the highest standard of scientific excellence. So we do this by ensuring that we award uh, research grants only through our major grant competitions that I previously mentioned or through pre-approved partnership mechanisms. And the importance of this is how we do it. So every project that we fund with donor um, or partnership money goes through an unbiased third-party peer review process. This means that the foundation or the specific partner or donor um, isn't playing a direct role in the individual who will be receiving the funding, but instead it's experts from the field who are reviewing each and every project that we fund to ensure that they are in line with the highest standards of scientific merit and excellence. It also means that we're not selecting projects independent of the community's needs. So the community, both scientific and those with lived experience, play a role in selecting the importance of the projects that we fund. It means that research ethics and methods are upheld, and this is really important to ensure that we're protecting our patients and families, as well as our donor and partner investments. We want to make sure that we're funding the best work that has the highest chance of success that can actually make a change, and that at no point during the process of the scientific research is any patient or community member or family member being put at risk due to poor ethics or poor design. Um, it also means that individual interests can play a role in designing research focus. So for instance, if someone came forward and said they had a strong interest in a specific genetic disease, we could definitely provide um, research grants in that area, but they have less of a role in which individuals are funded. So this means you could choose the topic area, but not necessarily the individual who will be receiving the funding. I've also included a graphic of how that works that you guys can refer to if you want to take a look at these slides at any other point. But the one thing I would really like to point out is this role that the foundation plays in really connecting the community to the researchers. 
this really is a cyclical thing that that happens and we really play the role in between all of these pieces. So researchers might be able to come up with an idea and write and submit grants. They come into the foundation and we say, yeah, that aligns with our priorities. It's kidney disease specific. You know, we're interested. But we also take the role of our patients and communities and stakeholders to help us design those priorities in the first place. That project would then go through this third party peer review process that I mentioned. And our peer review committees are made up of other researchers, foundational research team members, as well as community patients or stakeholders, those with lived experience. We then decide to either accept or reject the project. They get money to do the work. And then the foundation helps again with the knowledge translation pieces. So one of the biggest things that we hear is research happens and nobody knows what's going on. We help to do sort of those translation pieces between science speak and English or other language speak for, for a reality. And we really help to communicate those results back to the community patients and stakeholders. Their, their knowledge translation also is important to go back to the researchers and we play a role here as well. We hear what the patients want, what the community wants, and we communicate that back to the research community. So we really play a role in sort of this ongoing cycle of research. The second thing that I mentioned in that first slide with all the blue boxes of how research works um, is capacity building. So this is something that a lot of people tend not to think about when they're thinking about research. The Kidney Foundation of Canada has been engaged in running what we call the Crescent Program um, for the past, I think it's 19 years now, so 18 years. Um, the Crescent program came out of the recognition that although the burden of kidney disease continued to climb for Canadians, we were seeing a decrease in the number of clinicians and scientists that wanted to remain engaged in Canadian research science pertaining to the kidney health space. We came together with a group of collaborators, including the Canadian Institute for Health Research and the Canadian Society for Nephrology. So that's our clinical professional society in nephrology and kidney science. And we put together the Crescent Research Program. It's a capacity building program that helps to train the next generation of kidney researchers and clinicians. Um, it provides a salary award. So we provide funding for these people to do their work. And they also are, have access to a specialized kidney focused curriculum and mentorship program. So some statistics for the program on the right hand side, um, we have given 105 awards as of 2020, it was 105 awards and have trained a total of 80 trainees. And the very most exciting thing on this entire slide is the very last number there that says 87% of these individuals have remained in the kidney health field. So remember at the beginning, I told you the idea was we wanted to make sure that we were building capacity for kidney research science. And this program has been exceptionally successful at doing just that. So why would a academic research training program be important to the community or important to donors or important to patients? It's really important to understand that the beginning of a research or academic career is a very tough place to be. It's a very tough place to get, get involved um, and giving them support and mentorship along the way really does raise their chances of being successful and staying in the kidney research field. Not all national funding competitions are kidney health based. I mentioned that our, obviously our funding programs are very kidney science specific, but that's not the case for all of the funding organizations out there. So we want our kidney researchers to be competitive against other fields. This means competitive against some of the big heavy hitter scientific knowledge pieces like cancer or heart disease. We want to make sure that they're competitive against diabetes projects or gastrointestinal projects. We really want to make sure that Canadian research dollars from outside the foundation are also coming back into kidney research science to ensure the biggest changes for our community. Also, the better trained uh, these individuals are, the more likely they are to take on leadership roles in healthcare and to advocate for kidney health related challenges. The more people we can get into leadership roles, the more vocal they can be uh, to make change for the patients in the community. A lot of Crescent graduates have held extremely influential 
um, roles within the community, including the presidents of the Canadian Society for Transplant. Many of the presidents have been Crescent Fellows, presidents of the Canadian Society for Nephrology, individuals who work uh, in the federal and provincial governments advocating uh, for care, um, division heads, people who really have a voice and an ability to make change for patients. We're also providing leading edge training in things like patient-oriented research, sex and gender training, equity, diversity, inclusion, and how to collaborate and formulate top tier research teams. So really the overall goal of this program and one that we have been extremely successful at thus far and hope to continue to be successful at well into the future is ensuring that the next generation of kidney scientists are community connected, patient focused, and able to communicate their world to those that matter. And those are the people that are in this room today. I'm gonna to take a minute to talk about strategic partnerships and programs. So I mentioned on that first slide with the blue boxes that a certain percentage of our investment goes into partnership opportunities. I'm often asked, why would we want to do partnerships? Why wouldn't we just keep all of our investment in-house and put it into our individual grants that we're administrating? Um, what's the benefit of partnership? And I think it's really important to reframe why partnerships are so valuable. So the first and most obvious one to a lot of people is the word leveraging. If I can turn $1 in to $2 out the door to support research, that is better for kidney patients. So that's a big one. How can we put our, um, put our resources together for the betterment of the community? Another example of a partnership value is to build a unified voice. Sometimes it looks a lot stronger if you have four or five organizations saying, this is something that's really important and we're all willing to invest in it. That's the way that you can get the attention of people that we need to get the attention of to make change. It also is an opportunity for education, access, and to increase the visibility of kidney disease. It's shocking how few Canadians recognize kidney disease as a health challenge, and also how few researchers who are just outside the kidney health field are connected to kidney disease. So sometimes having partnerships is a good opportunity for us to be integrated within an overall health call. So for instance, we might have a we recently have partnered on a program that was looking at um, diabetes. So diabetes was the, the overarching goal of the program. And we came to the table and said, you know, we're really interested in having a diabetic kidney disease grant within this, within this pool. And it really gave that opportunity to give that piece of education. You know, kidney disease is really connected to diabetes and this is important and we need to invest in it. It also allows us um, to fund larger, potentially more transformational grants. So one thing that the general population uh, tends not to know is how incredibly expensive medical research can be. Um, so any opportunity for us to be able to fund larger trials or larger uh, grants is a great one, which can lead to the betterment of treatment options and overall wellness. Um, and then obviously, also, we like to partner on the capacity building program, such as the Crescent program that I just mentioned. On the other side of the slide, you'll see some of our current partners. So we partner, as I mentioned, at the Canadian Institutes of Health Research. This is the largest Canadian national health funder. Um, we also uh, partner with the Canadian Donation and Transplantation Research Program to fund research, and donate, or research in donation and transplant very specifically. And we are a major funder and partner in the CanSolve CKD network. This is a patient-oriented research network that is focused on kidney disease, uh, patient-oriented research specifically in kidney disease. So that's some of the examples of some of the organizations that we work with. Partnerships also afford us the ability to fund large multi-center studies. And I just wanted to put this slide up here because I know this is an Ontario-centric um, presentation, but I just really wanted to demonstrate how research really doesn't have borders. So research that's done in one province or one country can also affect those nationally and internationally coast to coast. So this is a project that we actually recently funded in that diabetic kidney disease 
pool that I was just speaking about. Um, and the lead researcher on this project is Dr. David Cherney, um, who is bolded there up at the top, um, who is centered at uh, the University Health Network in Toronto. But his research team, which is uh, denoted all over this slide, as you can see, there's a lot of them. And they come from all different provinces across Canada. So there's representation from other universities in Ontario, as well as multiple cities in uh, Alberta and British Columbia. So it's just this really important metric that I like to, to explain to people that just because the research is being funded in province X or country Y doesn't mean that it's not going to affect patients everywhere. And this is another example of how research is different from some of our other programs, which tend to be more geographically focused. So I'd like to, I just like to include that slide. I mentioned that one of the things we also focus on is resource development. So developing resources to help connect those with lived experience to, to research. One of these resources is uh, I'm going to use is a recent partnership with CanSolve CKD um, to redevelop what is referred to as the Kidney Link platform. So Kidney Link is a, a website that is used to connect those with lived experience to current and ongoing research projects. So it helps um, researchers to, to recruit participants for their projects. So this could be anything from taking a survey, being engaged in a trial, or actually becoming a patient partner. So things like actually helping to develop research questions or to vet uh, informational packages that might go out with a clinical trial and to really help empower patients to become engaged um, throughout the research process. It also provides links to training and resources to help patients and researchers work together better, um, really making a goal to break down sort of that invisible glass ceiling between, oof, they're a doctor and a researcher and they're a patient, and really to help bring everybody together for the greater good of the research process. The other thing that's available um, on this site, which is co-branded between us and CanSolve, is um, lay summaries of a lot of the research that's going on. So as scientific papers are published, they may or may not be accessible to the general public. And what we're trying to do is actually summarize those papers and those discoveries um, and put them out so that patients can have access and knowledge and understand what's going on in the research space. So anybody that's interested in becoming engaged in research, um, these are the types of developments that we're really focusing on to really make sure that research is accessible to our community. On that note, I'd like to just take a brief opportunity, and I only have, I think, two more slides now, on why lived experience is important and how the Kidney Foundation Research Program is working to include lived experience voices in our program. Our patient priorities are integrated into our research framework. So when we develop the Kidney Foundation's research plans and where we want to put our investment and focus, we'd always do this with a patient and community first lens. Researchers who are funded by the foundation are expected to be able to explain the value of their work to the community as a whole. So they're expected to be able to write lay language summaries, to come and speak at the educational webinars, or to provide um, pieces of information when requested. So Joanne is actually a really great example of that as somebody who does amazing, amazing work, but also is just so connected back to the community. And we really appreciate our research community for all that they do for our patients and our, and our um, organization. We also integrate lived experience into our grant review. So we actually have some of our grant review panels, the selection process that I showed the little diagram of, we actually include lived experience voices in that. Do they think that this project is important to them? Why or why not? Do they think patients could be engaged or caregivers could be engaged? How can they provide feedback? Are they interested in being engaged in the work? So those are some of the examples on how we um, ensure that our people, our community and our patients are really engaged in the research process. This is ongoing development. Um, I would say that the inclusion of those with lived experience in research overall is a relatively new concept, I'd say in the last 10 to 15 years, um, beyond being participants in trials, but actually actively playing an empowered role to drive research. Um, and we're working every day to build this, uh, build this system. So why is supporting Kidney, Fan Kidney Foundation research different? So, 
Kidney Foundation of Canada funds all kidney related research coast to coast. So everything from that slide all the way from education to prevention to cure. Our project initiatives are selected based on the best work to reach the goals um, and is not limited by institution or location. So our research program is national. Uh, we look at all of the best science and all of the best clini clinical developments um, coast to coast. So it's not, doesn't have to be in Toronto, doesn't have to be in Ottawa, doesn't have to be in Manitoba. Um, it's really who's doing the best work. Our selection process is of the highest quality with all of our projects being peer reviewed through a highly competitive process. Our dollars are often leveraged through other initiatives, giving more impact for investment in a kidney specific way. And our foundation is patient and community facing, so our va and values knowledge translation and communication, ensuring that those for whom the work is being done are kept apprised of how the work is going. So that is it for me. Um, thank you very much for coming today and for listening to Joanne and I. And if you have any questions, please let me know.